Hi everyone, this is Carmina. Welcome to my channel, Your Stars Aligned. I'm an astrologer and a card reader using the principles of the Cards of Truth system as taught by my teacher, Ernst Wilhelm, who is with us today. So, welcome. Okay, hi, thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for being here. So, there are so many questions that everybody, I guess, would like to ask you and asks you all the time on the forum as well. So I'm going to try not to be very repetitive, but there are some things that keep popping up. So <laughs> okay. I'll just get right to the point. First of all, I wanted to ask you because, you know, every planet has a maturation age and I know you're like, uh, in your K2 maturation, like the birth canal of the K2 maturation, what okay. does that feel like? <laughs> okay, yeah, I always talk a lot about maturations because I find that when somebody comes in for a maturation, if they're running a maturation when they come for a reading, 70% of what I need to talk about is just based on that maturation and it really overrides everything. Like for instance, like you mentioned, I'm running my K2 maturation this year. So K2 matures at 48, and so 47 to 48, he really starts waking up. And, um, you know, he'll actually start waking up at 45 slowly, but 47 to 48 is that mad rush, like you said, the birth canal. And when I looked at this year, one of the things I'll do to see how much, like, internal growth I might make in a given year is I'll just say, I'll look at the outer planet transit. Because the outer planet transits show a person when they really shift their consciousness or really understand things differently or do something differently. So when I looked at this year, I didn't have really any outer planet transit. And I thought to myself, oh, it's going to be a really mellow year, right? It won't be stressful. I won't have to deal with any demons, you know. I won't have to go through any shifts. I can just kick back and cruise and it'll be a nice year. But then K2 started maturing. I have to say after... It's definitely been the most intense year of my entire life. <laughs> Even more than the Rahu maturation? Oh, yeah. Rahu is a piece of cake. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was really amazing to me. To be in, and it was so great that there weren't any outer planets out there. I was in my Sati Sati, but I was in my Sati Sati in, you know, 2016 too. And um, I was in my Sati Sati... And it was a piece of cake, you know, it wasn't even stressful. I was in my Sati Sati most of 2015 and it wasn't even stressful. So I'm in the same, I'm still in the 12th Rashi right now. So I've been in the 12th Rashi and it wasn't even hard. And it wasn't that, I mean, sure, it had a few small Sati Sati things, but it wasn't that bad. But it was really just that K2 maturation that really started shifting things. And a long time ago, I always, when I did the last Rahu class, like four or five years ago, I said, okay, there'll be a part two once my K2 matures, right? So as K2 has been maturing, I've really been learning so much, not only about K2, but about Rahu that I'm really anxious to teach that next class if I can get to the next few months. <laughs> and I still have like five months to go. Actually, I only have four months to go. So I'm two thirds yeah. done. But yeah, like 70% is done. <laughs> yeah, 70%. But I, what I discovered was that um, with all these maturations, we have to take them um, one step at a time. We have our Jupiter maturation and then the next. And they all are leading up to this final K2 maturation. And what happens in the previous plant's maturation has an effect on your next maturation. It's almost like the dashas. When you have the dasha of Jupiter, what happens in Jupiter dasha kind of sets you up for Saturn dasha, right? And that sets you up for Mercury dasha. Well, it's the same with the maturations. These maturations are sort of working together to bring this. And the most important ones are most certainly the Saturn, Rahu, K2 maturations that all come in a row at the end. And I find that what happens during Saturn maturation can set a person up for what's going to happen in Rahu maturation. So everyone should just keep that in mind. If you're having trouble understanding your Rahu maturation, which is 42, go back to 36 and try to think about that, okay? Yeah. Now, my, what I found with Rahu maturation is that everyone has a plan for their lives. You know, a part of us, we're dreaming, I want my life to be this way. And 
we also have this idea that life will work out a certain way. If we, if we're, if we behave a certain way, if we um, do things a certain way, if we give certain things importance, we believe like life will work out. I call that our security paradigm. And that's ruled by K2. Unfortunately, that has nothing to do with reality. Okay. <laughs> you know, as humans, we're designed to live in the moment. But let's say in my last recent past life, I was, you know, just a little boy in a village and a bunch of Vikings showed up and raided my village and raped my sisters and killed my father. Then at that moment, to survive, I maybe had to grab my dad's, you know, axe and go out there and be like a rabid dog and kill as many Vikings as I could and escape, right, and survive. So in that situation, I had to like act like a rabid dog. It was required for my survival, so it was the right thing to do from that point of view. But then let's say the trauma of that made me always have this aggressiveness, like a rabid dog. And so then I die and then I'm born in the next lifetime. And in, sit in every situation, I get aggressive really easily. I get angry really easy. Uh, you know, so you have a starved Mars. <laughs> still, st yeah, still acting like a rabid dog. It, it wouldn't be healthy, right? But to that person, they would think, in order for me to be okay, I have to act like a rabid dog. So even though they want to have love and they want to have a good job, they're always acting like a rabid dog. And so they end up ruining their lives. So that's an extreme example of how K2 acts. He creates a security paradigm due to some past life karmas that we think in order to be okay, I have to be like this or have this. It's usually simple things like in order to be okay, I have to be the person who's in charge. In order to be okay, I have to be someone people can trust to fulfill their responsibility. So in order to be okay, I have to be responsible. In order to be okay, people have to like me or respect me. So we create these paradigms that were required for our survival because at some point we had to be that way in order to survive. But we develop that and hold on to that and we try to do those type of things all day long, all the time in everything we're doing. So you know how someone will come for dinner and or you'll you know have a dinner party and you know, you'll put um, the bowl of salad at the table in one place and they'll pick it up and put it somewhere else, <laughs> you know? So that some people have a constant need to be in control. If they don't have the final say on something, they don't feel okay because their security paradigm of K2 requires that of them. So the point I'm making is we all have these dreams of how we want to build our lives, but the K2 security paradigm is, um, dictating how we try to achieve those dreams and so often it's contrary to the fulfillment of those dreams okay so a person who has to be in charge all the time isn't going to be good in love they're only going to be good at work okay? yeah. <laughs> for instance you know so as a result we end up sort of ruining our lives and it's in very complicated ways it's not i just gave a couple simple examples but if we looked at horoscopes there's very specific ways that people behave out of K2 thinking this is required for me to survive and be okay. So when Rahu maturation comes along, a person is not okay. <laughs> okay. Because they've done so much of K2 that they've literally missed half their life. Because as humans, we're meant to live in the moment, which means when it's time to be a rabid dog, we act like a rabid dog. When it's time to be a beautiful rose, we act like a beautiful rose. You know, so we are meant to live in the moment, experience every moment fully. But K2 prevents us from doing that. And the moments we usually don't experience are the Rahu moments. The house Rahu's in, we don't experience that in a fulfilling way, for instance. The plants that are around Rahu, we don't experience those planets in fulfilling ways. So when Rahu matures, a person realizes, wait a minute, something's really, really, really missing. And, a, and they usually feel that way because K2 hasn't worked. They thought that as long as they could be K2 and, and focus on that house, like say K2 in the second house, as long as I can have the resources and the abilities to do whatever I need and be completely self-sufficient, everything will be okay. So then when 42 comes along and 
Rahu is maturing from 41 to 42 or sometimes from 42 to 43, they realize that having those resources, being self-sufficient, isn't going to work this time. They can't rely on it anymore. So maybe they have lots of money, but then something happens that money can't solve. So that would be a simple example. But they realize that K2 has failed them. And so then they have no choice but to start looking into Rahu. And then, the, so Rahu maturation is when the person gets a real vision of, wow, I really need this other house and I really need these other things indicated by Rahu or else I'm really not going to be able to survive anymore. Okay. So then they start going towards Rahu. And depending on their charts, they'll succeed with Rahu more or less this healthy or that healthy or this unhealthy, depending on the entirety of their chart. But then they start going in that direction. But then it's still life is not, still not working out just right. Okay. There's still something wrong because the person has so much, you know, things they've done wrong. They have so many feelings inside themselves of unhappiness and holes in themselves and frustrations and wounds, basically, from having lived an unbalanced life for so long that those don't just disappear once a person, you know, starts going towards Rahu. That's just the process of starting to heal those wounds, okay? So in um, K2 maturation, what I found is that a person gets to the point where they start really seeing how K2 has really ruined their life, <laughs> okay? So in Rahu maturation, they realize that K2 won't work for them. It failed them. And then they go towards Rahu. Mm -hmm. But then... When they get to K2 maturation, they realize not only they, they realize how K2 has not only failed them, which they realize in Rahu maturation, I mean it didn't give them what they needed, but that it's actually the reason their whole lives are so are, are not happy. That they've ruined their lives because they've done too much K2. And so all the hopes and dreams that they had for their life that were outside of the ballpark of K2 didn't get realized. Which means everything, like if you take the horoscope and you cut it in half. So we got K2 here and Rahu here. Then we draw a line through the horoscope. Everything on the K2 side of the line, the person did more of. Okay? But everything on the Rahu side of the line, because they are so fixated on trying to be okay and trying to have K2, they didn't get enough of that. And so K, doing K2 has ruined that other entire area of their life. And the funny thing about K2, it so often happens in ways where K2 is really trying to do noble things. You know, he's trying to be good. He's trying to serve other people. He's trying to be unselfish because K2 could have been thinking, to be okay, I have to be good. If everyone sees me as good, I'll be okay. Or being unselfish, if I'm unselfish, everything will be okay. Lots of times it's these very noble things. But sometimes it's a person needs to do the wrong thing. And if they don't, it'll have worse reper repercussions in doing the right thing, you know? Life is very tricky that way. <laughs> and so even if their K2 is making them do really wonderful things, it's still going to be responsible for them missing half of their life. Mm -hmm. So when K2 matures, a person starts going, wow, you know, how they've really ruined a lot of their life due to emphasis on K2. And they really see how not only has it not given them everything they need, which they learn in Rahu, but how it's actually sabotaged a lot of their hopes and dreams in, you know, when K2 matures. And that's a pretty serious realization. What I say is that to heal and work with Rahu, we need courage. A person has to have the courage to go into the Rahu house, which is like the jungle, the deep forest, and go out there and sort of learn how to survive. But then they have to have compassion when it comes to K2, because that's where all their problems have started and the person has to be compassionate towards themselves to be able to be okay with all those things ultimately. Cause we really muck up our lives with K2 and some people have this, they just can't be self forgiving, you know? And that's when people get to where they just can't forgive themselves, they can't have compassion for themselves. That's when I see they get stuck after the K2 maturation, mm -hmm. you know, and you know how we see some people who, at 60, 70, 80 years old are still really, you know, damaged people 
really haven't made any growth in 30 years. You know what I mean? And I, how I look at that is they didn't get a lot of benefit from their K2 maturation. They didn't switch gears. They kept believing the same thing. And I find that because they don't have the compassion for themselves to be accepting of their errors because some people have such an egocentric need to, um, you know, to not be, to be wrong ever, you know, that they can't begin to have compassion for themselves, you know? So it's a very humbling thing to K2 maturation ultimately. You know, nothing takes the ego away as much as K2, I think. Yeah. So your advice, like how to handle this is, like you said, to go into the Rahu jungle, like get involved with the Rahu things, the Rahu sign, the Rahu house, the Rahu planet. <laughs> the Rahu nakshatra. Yeah. yeah, a person has to do that. And they'll start doing that a little bit in um, the Rahu maturation. You know, and everyone does it to a different degree in the Rahu maturation, but they'll get a feel for, wait a minute, Ketu has failed me. It's not going to make me okay. I actually need the Rahu thing. Then depending on their courage and opportunity, they'll go towards Rahu at a certain rate, at a certain speed. Some people will jump into it really strongly. Other people might just say, I could use that, but never actually get it. It really depends on the chart itself. But the more the person can go out there and tackle the Rahu in their chart and the areas and involve themselves in a healthy way in the Rahu areas of their chart, the better off they're going to be. Mm. And some charts will have indicators in them that the person will be in the Rahu jungle earlier than the Rahu maturation. They'll get pulled into it. And that's a good thing. It will oftentimes make their lives appear more, you know, crazy and screwed up on the outside. But it's better than waiting all those years and letting things build up. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Ultimately. Yeah. So actually, like having, I don't know, for instance, having uh, Ketu with a well-dignified planet, like with a gentle Graha with Venus or with Jupiter forming some Argalas or some good yogas, that's actually like pulling you back or? <laughs> well, the more planets with Ketu, the more, every planet that's with Ketu, is a planet where there's a security paradigm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if it's with Venus, the person needs to feel like they have some social standing or some respect that their value in society is appreciated. So that'll be a security paradigm that they'll fight for throughout their lives, um, even when they don't need it. Okay, so it's definitely more difficult the more planets that are with k2 the security paradigm gets stronger and stronger now strong planets healthy planets are going are to be much less of a problem than planets that are like debilitated or combust like k2 in aries with saturn <laughs> yeah and also what's really important to look towards is the the dig bala of the planet that's the most that's important the, of the three it's the most important so if the planets with k2 and it doesn't have Digbala, and it doesn't have any, if it's in close to debilitation, and if it's closer to the sun and not more closer to retrogression, so it has low Chastabala, those are the plants that are really gonna ruin a person's life. Be, th th I mean, they're, all, they're the ones that will ruin their health, their mental health, their emotional health, their physical health, and also cause the most problems in their lives. On the other hand, a plant that's closer to exaltation, closer to retrogression, and um, so high in Chastabala and having more Digbala than not having Digbala, those planets um, are planets that are used a lot more effectively in general. But if they're a part of the person's security paradigm, they're still going to be limiting restricted planets. Because we ultimately we have to experience all of life to be fulfilled. So the problem with Rahu and K2 is it's one thing I've learned, I think the most important thing I've learned in the, about them in this rock K2 maturation is that we have so many planets affecting our consciousness. We got Saturn and Sun and Moon and Mars. And all those planets are conscious planets. All those planets are um, complete planets. You know, they're up there in the sky and Saturn's like, yeah, I'm a big plant, I'm a big planet and this is my job and he does his job. Even Saturn, all the planets do their jobs. Sometimes two planets have opposite jobs. For instance, the Saturn has the job to be lazy, okay? Because sometimes you need to be lazy. 
it's important for your recuperation and longevity to be lazy sometimes, okay? Then the sun has a job to rule the kingdom. Well, you can't be lazy and rule the kingdom at the same time. Yeah. This can't happen. If you're ruling the kingdom, you don't just get to sit around. It's like at any moment, your rest will be disturbed. You'll be busy. You'll sleep six hours a day if you're lucky. It's a lot of responsibility. So there, those two plants have opposite plans and everything they want to do, they, they have opposite functions. So those two plants are conjunct or aspecting each other. It'll cause a problem in the chart because those two opposite things are trying to do the same thing. Or do their both the exalted at the same time. <laughs> yeah, or both exalted at the same time. So that'll cause a problem to the person. But that's a problem that with a little common sense was really manageable. You can just say, okay, what do you want to do more? You want to be lazy more? Or you want to have to have all these hard burdens and responsibilities and lead, you know? You want to be in the front of the line or the back line? Saturn wants to be in the back of the line. Sun wants to be in the front of the line. You can't do both at the same time, right? Yeah. So, you know, but a Sun-Saturn person will want that in a way. So, but with little common sense, a person can work around that. So the most difficult thing in the chart that's caused by your normal, full, complete planets is really pretty resolvable. But people aren't able to resolve it because underneath all that is this very huge problem of Rahu and Ketu. <laughs> and the huge problem of Rahu and Ketu is that they are not a complete planet. They're, they're a demon who got cut in half right after he became immortal. So all these planets have consciousness, which makes them immortal. Only consciousness is immortal or everlasting, right? So Rahu and Ketu in many ways are the most immortal of the planets. And of course, the demon who became Rahu and Ketu got a boon from Brahma to become immortal, right? Yeah. Because these two planets, Rahu and Ketu, don't have bodies. They're, they're only consciousness. And they're, and they're immortal as a result. Consciousness is energy. Energy can never disappear. It's immortal. It can change forms, but it always is, right? So, Rahu and Ketu are like cut in half. As a result of Rahu and Ketu cut in half, people walk around feeling separated from things. So I used to teach, and I was taught that Saturn gives a consciousness a separation. That Saturn makes us feel separated from things. He'll separate us from things in a concrete way. So he'll take our spouse and put our spouse in another country. Or he'll kill our spouse. So he'll separate things in a concrete way. Or deny a spouse or whatever. He'll separate us from our wealth. You know, he'll take us away from things. But the consciousness of separation, that feeling that humans walk around with, a feeling separated from life, from everything that is, that makes living hard, that's Rahu and Ketu. That has nothing to do with Saturn. Mm -hmm. it is, you know, we blame everything on Saturn, but the truth is we carry that separation within us. True, we feel miserable. And so then when our spouse dies, we feel miserable. And then when we don't have a spouse because we never met a spouse, we feel lonely and separated and isolated those are because of saturn perhaps but the feeling that empty feeling has nothing to do with saturn the empty feeling comes because rahu and ketu is cut in half so that's the separation in our charts is this rahu and ketu mm -hmm. so the reason and so what that separation does our consciousness is actually only involved with ketu the majority of the time most of the time our consciousness is going in order to be okay, to survive, I have to do these K2 things. As a result, they're missing the other half of their life. If we're walking around only living half of our life, yes, we're going to feel separated. We're going to feel lonely. We're going to feel isolated because we're not experiencing God. We're not experiencing the divine, you know, all day long. We're only, you know, struggling to survive. And so... The only important thing we have to do in our chart, and the reason people come to ask for any predictions, is simply due to the fact that Rahu and Ketu are cut in half. <laughs> and if Rahu and Ketu weren't cut in half, we wouldn't have astrologers. No one would go to an astrologer. 
because everything else is very manageable. But because Rahu and K2 are cut in half, we blame that separation, the pain, the longings on a particular event in our life. And then we go to an astrologer, oh, when will this event get better so this pain and separation will go away? Well, the answer is the event will get better next March, but the pain, separation, longing after the initial excitement will be right, will be back. <laughs> Because Rahu and Ketu are still separating. So the only thing that has to happen in the chart is that people need to bring Rahu and Ketu back together. And that's what the whole spiritual process is. Ketu is the significant of liberation. Rahu is the opportunity to evolve past our limited experiences that we have. You know, Rahu is what we can say gives us the opportunity to grow deeper spiritually. And how that's shown is that um, Rahu has a lot to do with the deha, the body. And, you know, the masters, the yogis say that we're really lucky to get a human birth, to get this body that we can use to evolve. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's Rahu who allows us to have this body, actually, that allows life on earth to be possible. And we know this because there's a myth um, all, all the planets have an avatar or an, uh, an incarnation of God related to them. And three of them have incarnations of God that are the most pure, pure or sorry, four of them, okay? One of them is the Varaha avatar, which comes from Rahu. And that is a boar, like a pig, a wild oh, yeah. pig, you know, one of those boars. So what happened is after um, Brahma created the Prajapatis, you know, the, the people who are going to give create all life on earth, the rishis that created all life on earth, they're like, well, thanks for giving us this job, Brahma, but where are we going to create life? Because the earth is under the water. So the earth symbolizes the physical body. They're like, the earth is under the water. Um, you know, what are we going to do? And so they decided to pray to, from Vishnu, and out of Brahma's nose, this little boar came out flying around, and they got bigger and bigger and bigger, and it got so big, that, you know, just immense galactic proportions. And then it dove down into the water and picked up the earth on its horns. And after fighting with this evil demon, um, it brought the earth to the surface where it could be created. So we can see that Rahu is responsible for giving us the physical world with our physical bodies where we can develop further, which means to complete K2, the significator of liberation. So these two work together and they need to be brought together ultimately. And a person's success with life, their ability to have a happy life, really depends on how much they can bring Rahu and Ketu together. Yeah, because they're an axis. So like when you develop one house, you have to develop the one opposite, right? Mm -hmm. So for instance, like if you... Like you said, you have to go into the Rahu jungle, but if you have K2 in the 12th house, which in so many combinations is a combination for liberation, then you still have to go to the 6th house to do the Rahu things? You have to balance, you have to involve in the Rahu thing. So someone with K2 in the 12th house, which mean, has a security paradigm of, I'll be okay as long as I can become free of all my worldly entanglements. Yeah. Rahu in the six is going, well, you, you can't get free of your worldly entanglements. Not really. Until you pay your worldly debts. Which is Rahu in the sixth house. So they have to get involved in a certain way to pay their worldly debts. And that upon doing so, they can have more liberation. They can move on. Yeah. So, and see, yeah. see, liberation is a state of mind, right? And if we see something as different from another thing, we can't be liberated. So if a person sees life better being in the 12th house than life in the 6th house, they can't be liberated. It's just not possible. Liberation requires that a person sees life the same good no matter where they are, right? Yeah. <laughs> so whatever house Kate is in, we think life will be better and life will work better if I do this house. And if I, the other house, however, will ruin my life and I can't do it and I'm scared of doing that and that's, it's wrong to do that house even. So with that thought, how can they be 
become liberated. If they can't experience God in the other house, how can they experience God anywhere? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, people usually, I mean, they ask me and ask you a lot, like, what do you look at first in the chart? So I guess you answer that. I guess you look at Rahu and Ketu. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I focus on Rahu and Ketu now. It really a lot depends what's happening. Yeah. But the first thing I'll do when I look at a chart, I'll look how old they are. Okay. And see I'll the see maturation if, age. If, a, if either they're going into a maturation year mm -hmm. or they just finished one. So if, if they're 30, if they're 41, I know they're going to Rahu. If they're 42, I know they finished Rahu. But my experience, when you finish the maturation year of the malefic, Saturn, Rahu, Mars, and K2, you still need, there's still a lot of things you're trying to process and work out with that maturation or any afflicted planet. If you go into the Rahu maturation of any planet with some afflictions, it's really a two-year process. The planet matures and the person goes, what does that mean now in the next year? And so if that's the case, I know that I'm going to be spending most of my time on that planet that's maturing. And so I'll focus on that. So, um, And that's about 70% of the people, it seems. Yeah. <laughs> And so you can you can talk to them for an hour and not even have looked at the dashes. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> because I am um, speaking of uh, planet maturation ages. Uh, what do you think is more like more poignant in one person's life when they're twenty eight, the Mars or uh, maturation age or the Saturn return? Because usually people point out the Saturn return, but it's the Mars maturation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The Saturn return, the only reason the Saturn return is famous is because of Mars maturation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because honestly, the Saturn return by itself is not like a super critical event like a maturation. It just, it's just not. It's just another return of another planet. You know, we have Jupiter returns, we have Mercury returns and Sun return. We have them all the time. And, um, but the Mars maturation, I think a lot of the reason Saturn gets a certain rap is because of that Mars. And if you watch how, you know, of course, Western astrologers really use Saturn maturation a lot. And they'll start it at like, or sorry, not Saturn maturation, Saturn return a lot. And they'll start it at 27 to 30. Yeah. That whole time is, you know, they, it's like literally, oh, you're 27, you're going into your Saturn return. It's like, you know, my Saturn returns a year and a half away, two years <laughs> away still. Oh, you're 30, you just finished your Saturn return. Yeah, they come like, blame everything on the Saturn return, you know? Anything bad that could happen. In my experience, the Saturn return is like, it's kind of like bittersweet chocolate. Uh. <laughs> you know? That some nice things can come out of the Saturn return. It depends on your Saturn, what it's doing, and what the things mean, and what else is going on. But there's, always something there that makes it a little bitter in the long term, okay? Because there's an element of the Saturn return that has a lot to do with your duty and your, your karmic responsibility. And so there's gonna be some burdens involved in the things that the Saturn return brings, but they're completely manageable things. They're not impossible things where you have to be Superman to do. They're just, you know, things that common sense and a little effort can handle. But oftentimes they'll feel unmanageable, the same reason anything feels unmanageable, and that's because Rahu and K2 got cut in half. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I have to admit that when I was studying Western astrology, I was also, oh, it's your Saturn return. <laughs> that's why. <laughs> Saturn yeah. return. So I was doing the same thing. And it's very different, everyone, with their Saturn return. And, yeah. um, but I found that sometimes great things will happen, but there'll be a karmic burden involved. Um, and other times people will have very difficult experiences during their Saturn return because of the condition of their Saturns. But how I like to say it, you know, we all have hard lives. And how are we gonna deal with those hardships? When Saturn return happens, we start getting an idea of how to, we're gonna deal with those hardships. But it's not nearly as important as Saturn maturation or Mars maturation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, so since we were talking about Dashas, uh, you say a lot in your classes that Venus Rahu is the time that either makes or breaks a person. Do you want to elaborate a bit on that? Sure. Um, 
you know, there, there are so many ways that you can relate Venus and Rahu together to kind of get an idea. For instance, you can start at the Lagna and plot one planet around the chart. So you'll go Sun, Lagna, Moon, second house, Mars, third house, Mercury, fourth, um, Jupiter, fifth house, Venus, sixth house, Saturn, seventh house, Rahu, eighth house, K2, ninth house. Got it? Yeah. And the planets will have some affinity towards those houses. Okay, then you can go the opposite direction. You can go moon, second house, and so on. And that will put Venus in the eighth house and Rahu in the sixth house. So Venus and Rahu overlap in the sixth and eighth houses, okay? Mm -hmm. So both Venus and Rahu have a sixth and eighth house quality to them, actually. So in Venus, Rahu, Dasha, you're getting all that. Now, Jupiter and Ketu, on the other hand, have a fifth and ninth house period. So Jupiter Ketu periods can be the most surprisingly lucky periods in a person's life. Okay, so you can look at that period, see how lucky you are, and the Venus Rahu period, how much work you have to do. Okay. Yeah, so the two benefics are like opposites. <laughs> As always, <Auspicious>. right? <laughs> the two cool. problems are fighting, yeah. So <laughs> what I find is that in so many things can happen in Venus Rahu. One thing is Venus is a critical planet for how we're actually experiencing life. Okay. Because we really experience life on a very subtle level. We don't even experience life emotionally. Emotions are not that subtle of a quality of human consciousness. So life is all about energy, right? Everything is about energy. So like right now, I'm putting my arms on the table and the, ener the table has an energy that's hard and my arm has an energy that's soft. So I can feel, I can, I'm experiencing the edge of the table cutting into my arm from the weight of my arms, okay? So when you meet a person, you have an energy, they have an energy. What you're experiencing with that person is the energy. It's between the two people, right? So everything that is happening is all energy-based whether it's a person or something else, ultimately. But the perception of that energy, the experience of that energy is Venus. Okay? Yeah. So Venus is the planet with which we most actually experience life with, that we truly experience life with. After that, we go into lower states of experience. Venus For instance, is two-footed, right? What, the, what? Yeah, Venus is a biped. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But Venus is the first experience of life that we have in that we sense the energy. We sense things. We experience things in every cell of our body. And that later on gives rise to ideas and emotions and all kinds of stuff. So Rahu is the planet that um, we can say we're most out of touch with. It's the jungle. It's what we're least familiar with. It's what we um, try to hide from a lot. It's what we try to push away a lot. It's something we're scared of. It's something we'll actually act, often condemn in other people. So a lot of the behaviors that we'll condemn in other people will be indicated by our Rahu position. So a person who does a lot of that will go, oh, what's wrong with them? We won't like them. Things like that. But that's a big part of who we are but it's a part of us we've really started ignoring. We've ignored, but we are, that part of is part of us. To say Rahu is part of our consciousness, it's just a part of our conscious we've decided to ignore and shun, okay? So then when the Rahu Venus Dasha comes, a person starts feeling strange because all these parts of themselves that they've shunned start becoming into, they start becoming more aware of them, they start sensing them more. And so right away, people don't feel right in Rahu Venus Dasha or Venus Rahu for that matter, but especially Rahu Venus. Instead, people have, again, tried to build their life around K2, but during Rahu Venus, they start getting in touch with the fact that they, there's so much of them that's something different. They really start feeling different parts of themselves. And that's why they'll often do completely crazy things during Rahu Venus. Because the things they've been able to ignore, they can't, they can no longer, the feelings, the needs, the experiences that they're 
bodies are craving, that their minds are craving, that they've been ignoring because they're scared to go there or they see them as bad. Instead, they just go to more K2 experiences. In Rahu Venus, they can't ignore those anymore. And so one other thing that happens, when you see Rahu Venus, you can predict nine out of 10 times the person will separate from their spouse or their partner during that time, 90% certain. The reason is because the person they pick to marry is the person that supports their K2 security paradigm. And it ignores a big part of who they really are. And now Rahu is making Venus feel all these different parts of themselves that they can't ignore anymore. So they can't be with their partner anymore. Their partner's not working anymore. Their partner only worked so long as they ignored their, half their life, half of who they are, their Rahu half, got it? And so then they change so much and have such different needs, they find it impossible to be with that person. It takes a really healthy person who's you know, somehow managed to work some Rahu stuff in their life to get through their Rahu Venus with the same person, <laughs> okay? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so that's what's really happening. But it happens in all areas of life. The job we have, we chose that job because it supports our security paradigm. It's the best job we can find to support our security paradigm. Everything we have that we have choice over at all, we chose it because it makes K2 feel okay. And as a result, it ignored the other part of us that's indicated by Rahu. Mm -hmm. And the Rahu part is not a bad part of us. It's a part of our consciousness that we need to experience. So that's been ignored and Rahu Venus comes along and all of a sudden Venus who's that most sensitive of all planets the you know the psychic planet the planet who looks at you and knows what you're feeling even though you don't open your mouth who just senses things Venus senses all these other energies within them all these other needs within them and they can't ignore it anymore so all of a sudden their job is not right for them you know they're nothing's wrong right for them everything feels off so they go into this period feeling strange now sometimes people won't really feel that what will happen is they'll track situations that make them realize that so their spouse will have an affair and leave them their boss will fire them the company they work for goes out of business so it can also happen from the other end where our circumstances come together to um you know sh show them that part of themselves but again it's because that part of themselves attracted those circumstances at that time so it's a similar thing where a person becomes aware of the fact that there's a whole part of life that they've been neglecting because of their k2 security paradigm that they cannot they can no longer ignore they just start feeling it themselves or outside circumstances change in a way that they have no choice but to experience it so then the person can do one of two things they can be made or broken okay make make them or break them right yeah if it may if it breaks them that basically means they're not able to integrate the new experiences the new sensations and experience those in real ways in life they can't somehow go out and live upon the other part of themselves that they've been burying okay so they can't find a healthy self-expression of rahu basically if they can't do that, they'll feel miserable, they'll feel treated unfairly, they'll feel like um, nobody cares about them, that God screwed them, that they have no chance in life because they're still clinging to the idea that K2 is going to get them through life okay, which it won't. If it makes them, it shows they're really able to embrace the other part of themselves, their other half. They're really able to embrace that other half and work with it to build a more fulfilling and more successful life on all levels. So it's, um, you, and, you, and you never know, the, the thing about Rahu Venus, it's the most surprising period of all. It's an eighth house connected period, right? You never know what's gonna happen in Rahu Venus because what you don't know if all, you say you've got, I mean, just this is how it is. There's all kinds of parts of you that you don't know about, that you're not aware of. You're living your life without that awareness. Then all of a sudden, we flick a switch, Rahu Venus, all of a sudden, your nerves go, wait a minute, what about all this other stuff? How, you know, at that point, your whole life is getting all this unexpected stuff. It's all unexpected, 
because it's all stuff a person's not conscious about in themselves. Yeah. So it's unexpected. Or yeah. events come to show them unexpected things of themselves, to show them parts of themselves they have been wanting to ignore. So uh, do you think if a person is born like with Rahu and the Lagna or during Rahu Dasha or in a Rahu Nakshatra, Lagna or Moon, you think they are more connected to Rahu from the beginning or that doesn't um, really matter? Yeah, they'll be more connected. The things that help a person more connected to Rahu, one of the big ones is Rahu Moon. Mm -hmm. So people with Rahu Moon are more connected to Rahu. Now that's a good and bad thing. And you'll see people with Rahu Moon either make not as much progress as the average person or more. Okay? So they're because, extreme. <laughs> yeah, because let's, Rahu's like the jungle that your person's never, the big scary jungle. Now, if I throw you into the jungle before you're ready, which means before your Rahu maturation, okay, that's what happens when the Rahu moon is there. The person gets thrown in the jungle early. So if you're thrown in the jungle early, you've got two options. One option is to hide under a tree and cower and bury yourself in a hole and never come out. That's the Rahu person who doesn't make any progress, okay? Yeah. <laughs> to just cut off, cut yourself off from everything and protect yourself from all those scary things out there in the jungle. The other option is to explore the jungle. The person who explores the jungle is gonna fall into holes, which means they're gonna cause all, they're gonna create all kinds of unhappy situations. They're gonna marry the wrong person, divorce them, have an affair with the wrong person, have an affair with the right person. They'll have the craziest lives manageable, but at least they're still Checking out what's in the jungle, right? <laughs> yeah. And exploring the jungle when you're not ready, you can't blame the person for doing some dumb things in the jungle. So if you throw a six-year-old in the jungle, they're going to do a lot of dumb things. They're going to find a snake and play with it, right? Yeah. Okay. So. Rahu is the snake. <laughs> yeah. It's everything in that jungle. So with a person with Rahu Moon does the same thing. Their circumstances put them in the jungle earlier, so they start exploring it. And they're going to make a lot of mistakes exploring it, but in exploring it, they start understanding the jungle. So then all of a sudden, once they understand the jungle, they can be way ahead of the average person after having a lot of very interesting stories to tell. Okay? <laughs> so Rahu Moon, that's the two ways like Rahu Moon will work, but the Rahu Moon encourages a person to go towards the jungle. Another thing that will do that if the Ascendant Lord is with Rahu. Okay? especially if it's a good dignified ascendant lord mm -hmm. then the ruler of k2 with rahu helps a person go into the jungle earlier mm -hmm. and so these people might do a lot of more dumb things until they're 42 but when their rahu matures usually they're more they, you know they're more used to being in the jungle and so they'll usually have an easier maturation it won't be as much of a shock because they've already been in the jungle a lot Okay. Yeah. Um, do you think because uh, their planets, you know, there are the dashas, uh, the Vimshotri dasha, and there's also the planets who have their natural dashas. For instance, Venus has like from 16 to 32. Do you think uh, having your Rahu dasha during the Venus natural age dasha has similar effects as Venus Rahu or Rahu Venus? Yeah, I definitely think that Rahu Dasha during you know 16 to 32 is a, is a time, a more crazy time, where Rahu definitely comes through a lot more. Um, I never thought of it that way, but yeah, it's a good observation on your part. It definitely seems to do that, to stir up um, Rahu more. <laughs> okay, thank yeah. you. So now I think I'm gonna switch on to a different topic. Okay, uh, good. <laughs> okay, so, uh, from Jaimini uh, principles in astrology, we know that uh, Mercury and Jupiter are manifesting planets. But in Parashara Yoga Judgment, often we see that Mercury and uh, Jupiter are yoga breakers. And for me, I mean, it's difficult to wrap my head around like how they can manifest that house and at the same time ruin the yoga. Okay. So, because, all right. 
there's a group of yogas, there's a chapter in Brihat Parashara called Yoga Karikas. It's one of the most misunderstood chapters in the book. And in that chapter, he tells us how to find the plants that will cause what he calls a Raj Yoga, combination for success. And that happens when an angle and shrine lord basically come together. But they come together with very specific principles. So all angle lords won't work and so on. So one of the principles is that for certain lagnas like Gemini, Jupiter is an evil planet and can't form yogas. He's actually going to, any of those yogas, not other yogas, not any of the other yogas out there, but only these group of yogas have to be judged with these principles. As a malefic to these particular angle trine yogas, Jupiter influence in it will damage the yoga because it's evil. Now, your question is, how can a plant that damages a yoga manifest the house? Like Jupiter's a, a manifester. Yeah. Because yoga and having are completely different things. And lots of times you'll find the most powerful yogas end up causing the person to lose the things of the houses. Mm -hmm. So it's not like that success is free. Think of a person who becomes successful, right? How, what are, how much do they sacrifice to have that success? Anyone who's successful is successful because they've made huge sacrifices in other areas of their life, which means they've said, I'm not going to have this thing of the Baba. Instead, I'm going to do something great. That's basically success. The reason most people aren't successful because they don't want to make the sacrifices required to be successful. Read anyone who's successful is a story, and it's a story of sacrifice, right? Yeah. And the more successful they are, if they're uber successful, then they always um, have more sacrifices they make. So what happens is with that thing, Jupiter will manifest the house and manifest the planets, that the things those planets rule, the houses they rule, so say you've got, um, for Gemini, say you've got um, Venus, which is the only planet that can cause a yoga, placed in the fourth house. It's debilitated there. So what? It's still going to cause a yoga, okay? And let's say Jupiter is up there in the 10th house, aspecting the Venus. Jupiter will reduce that yoga of Venus. It won't be a big successful yoga anymore. So they won't have the sex, sex, success they normally have. Or stick Venus in the first house and put Jupiter in the seventh house. Jupiter's in its own sign aspecting it now. The Venus in Ver Gemini in the first now. Same thing. The yoga of Venus gets reduced. But the things of Venus, the houses it rules, they'll get more of. So they'll get more money to spend 12th house. They'll have more happiness with their children in fifth house. But they won't have the success that they would have if Jupiter wasn't there. So basically, Venus says, I want to enjoy my life, go on more vacations and 12th house things, and I want to enjoy my kids, and I'm not willing to sacrifice those things for the success I might otherwise have had. So the person with the Jupiter aspect in the Venus in that case is going to be the happier person. <laughs> because they're going to be on vacation with their with their kids right yeah all right but there, no one's going to know that they're happy they're they'll know that the successful person exists more because they're more successful so more people will know about that person but that doesn't mean they're happier yeah. so again those principles are only to be used for judging these specific yogas they have no other purpose and if we try to use them in other things we'll make mistakes mm-hmm so that's how it that's how it works. It's what about having something or being something. Mm -hmm. Are you do you have something and you enjoy it, or you don't have it and you're spending time being something instead? That's yeah. what success boils down to. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so staying in the this realm of uh, parashara of yogas, you know, um, what do you think? I mean, what is to you the difference between pursuing um, your dharma and pursuing desire which is karma because sometimes people think they're pursuing their dharma and their inspiration but it's actually desires i personally think i, I mean from what i've understood i think it's 
uh, pursuing your inspiration is to do things that benefit the greater good and pursuing your desires they only benefit yourself or is that right or how not necessarily it's a very subtle difference because the dharma houses are one five nine right yeah and the desire houses are three seven eleven so there's a there's a very they're opposite houses yeah so there's some, there's something about them that's reflective, that's similar. Because opposite houses like looking in the mirror. How do you tell the mirror from the real thing, right? Yeah. So both people, whether you've got Dharma yoga is present or desire yoga is Kama yoga is present. The Dharma yogas are when, are the yogas Parashara talks about in that chapter, the, what he calls the Raj yogas. The Kama yogas are similarly formed, but with third, seventh, and eleventh Lord. Mm -hmm. Okay, I teach that in the course, and I'm probably you probably maybe have some video on it. But I don't want to talk about how to do that. But what's the difference? Okay, a Dharma person goes, "This is what I am. This is what I'm here to express. This is the truth I'm here to express." And I'm gonna. This is the truth I'm gonna. I'm going to express. It comes out of my nature of who I am. Okay, a Kama Yoga person, or what Desire Kama does is we ultimately we only have one desire. The desire we have is to be welcomed socially, to be loved, to be treated well by our peers, to be the you know, star of the party, for people to like us, you know, for everyone want to invite us for dinner, for you know, all the beautiful women or all the handsome men to want us. You know, that's what desire largely revolves around. So when there's a point in the person's life where they have a choice of, you know, something comes up where they can do something that they feel is what they really are, what they really believe in, or they can do what's going to get the most attention, mm -hmm. that's going to get them the most love, the most um, students, the nicest reputation. The Kama Yoga person chooses on the size of the reputation and the, and the rewards of the, that, that people can provide for them. And that can include money, success, fame, notoriety. Whereas a Dharma person chooses, the, you know, chooses to express what they feel is really them, what they feel is really true. Okay? And so that's ultimately the difference. Yeah. So in the end, in the end of the day, only the dharma yogas are king yogas make you a true king yeah because the king what do kings do kings are here to bring something better to the world mm -hmm. if a person has to sell out to be loved and to be appreciated and to have be invited to dinner and to get paid more they're basically selling out to the collective consciousness which means they're reducing something they believe in order to give the people not what's right, but what they're used to, mm -hmm. which means they're not, they're not a leader anymore. They're just a part of the group. You understand? Yeah. And that means they're not a king. <laughs> yeah. so those yogas don't make a person a king, but they will make a person very popular. Most Hollywood stars, most musicians, entertainers, oh authors, yeah. they all have kama yoga is very strong. And you, which are desire yogas, and usually artha yogas, which are wealth yogas, strong mm -hmm. because a lot of wealth comes with those positions. Okay. Yeah. Whereas a dharma yoga person might be wealthy, but they might be fame loved by everybody. But you know, if they were, it was because eventually the public, the world, embraced who they were truly, mm -hmm. and they didn't sell out in order to get it. So that's the difference. It's a subtle difference. And you won't notice it by watching the person, just seeing it. It's hard to tell. Yeah. But that's what happens inside the person. And if you look closely, you'll see. But you have to know the person intimately. You have to know their chart. What did they, what did they, what did they not express? Because express, expressing that might cause problems. So with the Dharma Yoga person, they say, if I don't do this, I won't be able to live with myself. The Kama Yoga person thinks, if I don't do this, I won't be able to live with the people around me. Okay? Yeah. So one person chooses based on the people around them. The Kama Yoga person, the Dharma Yoga person chooses based on 
living with themselves. Okay. Yeah. I really liked your analogy, like how the Dharma yogas mirrored are the Kama yogas. That makes me think of all the superhero movies when at some point there comes like a, an opposite world superhero that it's just yeah. like that one, but it's like evil. And then it gets defeated. So like Dharma conquers mm -hmm. Kama. In the end. Exactly. And it's a struggle. Even people who have only Dharma yogas, when they come to those decision-making periods, it's very hard for them to go towards the Dharma. It's not like they, they do it without thinking about it. It's a very scary mm -hmm. thing for them to do because that peer pressure, the pressure of the people in our lives, it's a huge pressure. And it's very hard as a human who's this social creature to go against that. Uh, pressure mm -hmm. and it's a challenge for these people to do it so are you still there i think you froze up there you are okay. uh, uh, yeah your voice was a bit yeah but i think we're good now <laughs> so um thank you for answering that mm, what else? okay good <laughs> uh, yeah, what would you tell people that would want to study astrology? So many people are asking me, can I be an astrologer? I never tell anyone don't study astrology. Like <laughs> Everyone can study astrology. But what is your, I mean, what is your answer when somebody says that to you without looking at your chart, <laughs> their chart? <laughs> yeah, I think that... Um anyone who's intellectually centered can benefit from studying astrology yeah. you know what in what way they'll benefit can be very different but there's a benefit to anyone who studies astrology yeah. every scientist should study astrology no matter what they do because you know scientists are trying to discover things and a lot of these things are trying to discover they don't have a map of it the wonderful thing about astrology is that astrology is the map of how creation works. So it doesn't matter what you're trying to study or discover in the world, it'll follow astrological principles. And so having this map of astrological concepts and principles will help any scientist make progress more rapidly. And anyone who is a, you know, who deals with any unhappiness, of course, you know, <laughs> which is everyone, can come to terms with that more readily with studying astrology. So really, I teach, I let, I, I mean, some people, they'll write, oh, will you take me as a student? As if it's like, oh, so a selective thing. My feeling is the world would be a better place when they teach astrology in kindergarten, you know? Yeah, <laughs> I agree. You know, can you imagine if we would just teach people like about their Atmakarikas and their type of intelligence based on Jaimini? You know, just go to the, yeah. <laughs> Just these few things that if people knew at a young age, how much trouble it would save them, you know? Yeah. Or if they just understood how Rahun K2 worked at a young age, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, I think, you know, schools won't be worth sending my kids to until they start teaching astrology at them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a couple of questions from Zoom Root from the Kala Forum. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, she says, um, according to the old text, as you mentioned, the Rishis knew how to measure the beginning of time where all the planets were aligned at Aries. What about the end of times? Would you like to speak about the Yuga that we are in and moving towards to? Is it very common to coincide with some prediction made that the end of the world has come due to various reasons? Wouldn't there be the specific placements on the charts of every being on Earth to point out something like that? Okay. So... The ancient Hindus had a mastery of time that really is beyond comprehension. They broke down time to atomic levels, meaning they had time, like the big, smallest part of time we use regularly is a second, right? Yeah. They broke down time to the, the time it takes an atom to revolve around a proton, okay? <laughs> and their time, they had time broken down to such minute particles. Now, conceptually, they had it broken down. We can't create a clock that will measure that, of course. Or if we could, we can't even look at the clock at the right time because the time it takes to look at the clock. So the baby comes out, and we look at the clock, and we're already a few time slots later. So we only can measure time 
with practically within about a tenth of a second at best. But the Hindus broke down time into much smaller parts. And they had their idea of when creation started, when the, you know, in this solar system, in this galaxy, that correlates to the times that modern scientists have estimated it. They also have an idea of how long the galaxy will last, which correlates to what scientists believe. I don't remember all the numbers now because I, you didn't, I could have prepared for it if I know you're going to ask me this. That's okay. So they knew when creation would end. They call this a day of Brahma. So one big bang of the galactic center throwing out a galaxy, then sucking the galaxy back in, that's called a day of Brahma. Okay, what day of creation. And then, um, you know, it'll, there'll be another one and another one. So um, the, um, so, Yes, the end of the world is a very long time away. So, for instance, they broke the day of the age of Brahma into what they call Manvantaras. Okay, and there's 14. I hope I remember all this. 14 Manvantaras, and in each Manvantara, there are. Oh gosh, I'm, I hope I don't say this number wrong. Okay, forgive me if I do. 72 yugas. 72 cycles of yuga so that's 72 processions of the equinoxes that's a lot of time right now we're in the middle of the seventh manvantara which means it ain't over for the human race for a very long time <laughs> Yay. it's not it's not over for the human race for 7.5 times 72 times 24,000. so we that's a lot have of you to get liberated <laughs> Well, who knows? Sometimes you gotta wonder. <laughs> so there's a long homo species of some sort will be around for millions of years more according to the Hindu calculations. Okay. Now there's someone's always predicting the end of the world. Yeah. Right? There's always some group somewhere that thinks the end is nigh. Maybe. And that's because of their pathology. They have a pathology that within themselves that they can't fix, that the only solution to their problem is death and destruction. Okay. So they project that feeling into their world predictions and predict death and destruction. But the, all those are false. The world's not gonna come to an end. We will go through cycles of rise and decay. You know, we will go through cleansing cycles. We've, you know, we've been through cleansing cycles like World War II, lose 40 million people or more and we'll go through more cleansing cycles but none of them are going to be the end of the world there's always someone there who says oh it's the end of the world the civil war in the united states everyone in the united states thought this was armageddon the beginning of armageddon was the civil war in the united states lots of people thought world war ii was world war one was everyone thinks armageddon is the next big thing but we're still five million years away from armageddon and how we evolve as a species is hard to say the time periods of um that the hindus have calculated go back to about five million years to where um the first homo type species were I mean, scientists believe the first homo type species existed they weren't homo sapiens but some type of homo species you know that they have their different ideas and prejudices about okay um so, you know, we'll likely evolve as humans over those five million years, you know. But how we'll evolve, who knows. But the human species of some sort will be around for a while, I think. Thank you. Yeah. Um, it's I hard to imagine when you watch how stupid we are, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're doing our best in, under the circumstances. <laughs> yeah, but according to the Hindu scriptures, yes, the humans will be around a long time still. Yeah. I only have one more question for you because I know you are busy and you have a lot to do. But first, I want to I want to tell people like if you want to uh, participate in discussions about astrology, if you have Kala software or if you study the cards of truth, you can come on the study group like Yahoo group studying Kala. So we have conversations about a lot of topics all the time there. And. Okay. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask you, it's like two questions merged into one, and I think I know your opinion, but some people maybe don't. 
So like how does um, free will uh, work with uh, the power of like manifesting stuff, manifestation and uh, somebody was asking if you practice mantras and things like that, like if you do rituals, meditation. Okay, so the whole free will thing is really the most controversial thing. When people say free will, they ask it in the context of, I am going to make this happen. <laughs> okay, and that, that type of free will does not exist. If you use I, it doesn't exist, mm -hmm. okay? Because I doesn't exist. I is a concept. I is the idea of separate existence. That's all I is. It's an idea. An idea has no power. It has no muscles. It has no will. The only thing that has power, will, is energy. And that energy embodies in each person and creates an I consciousness. But that, that's the ego, that's, the ego's not real. So there is no free will from the idea of I can do this even though my planets say otherwise, okay? All there is is God's will. And the, um, you know, and God's will flows through people, some more, some less, <laughs> right? But it's never attached to the I. So if a person thinks they're doing it, if they're convinced I'm doing this, I'm going to make this happen, that's not God's will. That's just their horoscope working through them. So 75% of what happens to us in life is indicated in our horoscope. Okay? Now, we have patterns within us that we usually follow for the other 25%. And the most dominant pattern is K2. So right away, K2 becomes responsible for the majority of our life. More, we're more responsible for how our life is than any other single planet. Because he's the strong, he's the pattern we can't break away from without a lot of effort. So that 25% could be God's will, but we make it just an extension of our horoscopes as long as we're in ego consciousness. Okay. The longer saying, I'm going to do this. The minute a person says, I'm going to make this happen, I have to have it this way, and no plan's going to get in my way, all they're doing is following the paradigms of their K2. It's not free will at all. It's K2's will. Okay? Yeah. So what we have free will about is our relationship to our experiences. You know? Meaning we have a relationship, we have a free will over our relationship to the things around us in life, to the other people in our life. Do we want, do we want to respond, you know, out of our patterns or do we want to respond wisely? That we can choose. So we have the choice of not so much what's in our life, but how we experience what's in our life. Okay. And that we have a lot of free will, as much free will as we want to take. It's just usually we don't want to take it. We'd rather just fulfill our patterns, you know? But free will exists, but it has nothing to do with the ego. It has nothing to do with the desires of the individual. It has nothing to do with the needs of the individual. Free will is God's will flowing through a person that's not indicated in their chart, <laughs> okay? And a lot of people don't like hearing that, but when you know people love what people love doing is they love sticking to their security paradigm of k2 and they'll come up with all kinds of ways to convince themselves that that's a good thing so you'll get a teacher who has a security paradigm of k2 that says i at some point they needed to really exert themselves to survive so their security paradigm is by exerting myself i can make every anything happen i want I can move Saturn out of the sky, no problem. Those planets don't have to affect me, no pattern. They're just supporting their own security paradigm. It's not how it works in practice, you know? So, but we have a lot of, we have 100% free will about how we relate to our, to the things in our life. But most people don't use that. If they're not using that, then God's will is certainly not going to be flowing through a person. 
So the only free will we have to bother with is the free will of how we relate to our to the what's around us. Are we going to do it more healthily or more sickly? If we do it more healthily, then God's will can start flowing through us. And then anything's possible. But God doesn't care about the ego. In the Bible, it says God is no respecter of persons. He's no respecter of the egos. In, um, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, it talks about how God just picks people up and puts them wherever he wants on the chessboard of life. That it doesn't, he doesn't care that you love this person. He just picks you up and puts you over there. He doesn't care. He doesn't care about the needs of the ego, the needs, needs of the ego. And that's obvious. Look around you. You know, God is the energy that's enlivening everything. It enlivened us and it wants to live through us, but we get our patterns in the way. Don't, the reason people ask about free will, I want free will, I want my life to be different, is because they're living in a deep state of ignorance. An enlightened person doesn't care about free will because God's will is all that matters. And God's will is what's manifesting right now. Okay, so it's every person's job to experience what's manifesting right now as a beautiful part of their life. But the reason they can't do it is because they're too stuck on their security paradigm to enjoy life, to enjoy live in the moment. So learning to live in the moment, putting Rahu and K2 back together, that's what free will can actually do. That all happens in our consciousness. It has nothing to do with anything outside. Once that happens, God can start to flow through us. More energy can flow through the person instead of the limited energy of the horoscope. So that 25% can be God's will flowing through a person instead of just a 25% of a continuation of the themes in their horoscope already, especially the K2 themes. But when people ask and demand free will exist and get mad at, you know, get mad at hearing that free will doesn't exist in the way they want it to exist, because their security paradigm needs them to believe that it does. And that's why they get mad. Anytime something makes you angry or makes you feel threatened, it's doing it because it's threatening your security paradigm. Which means everyone I've just pissed off, I've given you a chance to look inside yourself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for doing this, uh, taking the time to do this interview. Sure, my pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and I'll see you again soon. I'm, I'm going to post the links to your website below. And Okay. I'm going to start the recording. Okay.